Entrepreneurs Over 40, Episode 55, with Dan Schinder talking about how you can have social media on steroids. There's a lot of people who are forever learners with no action. And with learning and no action, the knowledge is worthless. Without application of the knowledge, there's no progress. And without progress, it's all for naught. Just put it out there and do it. You're listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40, the show for somewhat mature entrepreneurs and side hustlers. And now your host, Greg Mills. Our guest today has built a global presence with over 1 million active followers, reaching millions more people a week and growing by 4,500 a week from over 130 countries, reaching millions more people a month using content marketing on social media and brand building strategies that he developed on social media while growing the Drum Talk TV brand. The brand reached 120 plus million people in all of 2021. All of this was done 100% organically. No boosting posts, no paid ads. The high level of engagement yields an average of 5 million in reach, 2 million post engagements, 4 million video views, all in every seven-day period. He's never paid for advertising or boosting posts of the brand's content. With the social media on steroids courses in consulting, he shares exactly how he turned Drum Talk TV from an idea into a profitable business and how you can utilize these strategies to grow your business too, no matter what stage you're at currently. What he teaches can work for virtually any business in any industry, from a local model to global. He understands busy as he and his wife have a blended family of 11 kids and 19 grandchildren. Woo. He says, if you're serious about what you do, get serious about how you market it. Without further ado, Dan Schender. Hey, Greg Mills. Thanks so much for having me on Entrepreneur is over 40. I'm not sure I qualify. Uh, well, I, I'm not I, I, I wish I didn't qualify. <laughs> I very qualify. <laughs> it's great to have you, Dan. And next time I'm going to come up with something that's easier to pronounce than entrepreneurs for myself. I don't know how many <laughs> no times worries. I've slaughtered that. <laughs> it's a fun word. Yep. Now, can you take a few moments and fill in the gaps from that intro and bring us up to speed with what's going on in your world today? Yeah, and it is an interesting world indeed. Drum Talk TV is nine years and four months old and a few days. I started it January 7th of 2013, and I actually started my brand of consulting and courses, Social Media on Steroids, shortly after mm -hmm. that. Technically, I started teaching it before that, but... It was when in that first year of Drum Talk TV, someone pointed out that we were achieving 900% more online reach and engagement than all of our industry peers, which is a fluffy word for competitors. We were achieving 900% more than all of them combined. And it was in that moment that I decided to start another company called Advanced Social Marketing and really develop these courses and consulting to teach people how to do what I've done so that they could thrive doing what they love, helping other people, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit business in any industry, it really does all work the same. So both companies are doing really well. I'm having a blast. Drum Talk TV drives me pretty nuts. We're going through two or three major expansions simultaneously going into a couple new areas that we've never been into. And that's a full-time 80 hour a week career. And then doing my teaching and consulting is a full-time thing. I don't know how I keep up with it all, but it's a lot of fun. I love doing it. Otherwise I wouldn't do it. I don't do anything unless it's fun. And when I teach, I make it fun. I think that's the best way people learn. Do you ever feel kind of awkward putting stuff out there? I'm not even talking about sharing something salacious. I'm just talking about, do you ever feel awkward posting something on either LinkedIn or any type of social media? Because no. that, that has really taken me a while to get over. I really don't. And I think because, why is that? Well, I, I, maybe this will help. I'll, I'll, I have, so double life again. On LinkedIn, I post 
pretty much no personal stuff for the most part. 99% of it is not from my personal life. And almost zero is drum talk TV. It's all related to social media on steroids and teaching, marketing and marketing training and being an entrepreneur, motivating, inspiring others. It's all that. My podcast, all that. On my personal Facebook page, there's almost zero business. From time to time, I might post a uh, podcast episode or maybe a interview on drum talk tv with one of my biggest favorite influences other than that if you scroll through my personal facebook page it's my dog and my cat my dog my flowers i love gardening the lizard in the garden the grasshopper butterfly my my cat i don't know if i mentioned her oh and my dog him and sometimes them together my wife and i sitting around the fire my dog and my cat, maybe a couple of the grandkids, the ones we like, none of the kids, because we don't like any of them. Hey, it's man. all that, almost no business. Yeah. yeah, and the Drum Talk TV pages are different. We've got like five channels. Of course, they're all almost zero, zero, zero personal, Dan, unless it's my wife and I wishing everybody well after a show that we did or covering an event or something and thanking our team and, you know, that all of that stuff. Other than that, I keep it very separate, but it's funny you mentioned what you just mentioned and I'll tell you why, Greg, and this is for everybody else's edification as well. I, so I teach a mastery class that basically teaches everything I've learned and the 50,000 plus hours of getting content marketing right and achieving tremendous results. And with that master class, we all belong to a private Facebook messenger group so that we can all kind of talk about wins of the week. I do once a week Q and A's on Zoom with just the members, but if they can't wait till Monday, if they're stuck on something, they could throw a question in there. I might answer it. Someone else in the group might know the answer because they've been with me longer. I just shared something yesterday that popped up on my YouTube feed. I can't even remember the channel and it's a very short uh, video of a gentleman saying, Get 1% better with every upload. Punch perfection in the face. Get rid of fear. Just do it. And, and that's always been my motto. When I did my cooking show, I had no idea how to do a cooking show. But you know what? I had seven freaking TVs in my house. I thought I knew everything I needed to know. I was just going to do it. Dove in. Just dove in and do it. Um, did it. Did it. Dove in and do it. I dove in and did it. When hey, I started, I won't, drum talk, I, I won't be correcting you on grammar on this show. <laughs> okay. I, drum talk TV, same thing. I had a plan, had an idea. Well, in a large part, it was really my wife's idea. And I adapted to it and then I put it out there. I don't know what, and I'm not criticizing, but I don't know what people are afraid of. No matter how long you've been doing something, no matter how good you are at it, in three years, you're going to look at it and go, oh, wow, that was like caveman compared to how I'm doing now. It's all relative. People need to just get off their asses and just do it. There's a lot of people, bless their hearts, there's a lot of people who are forever learners with no action. And with learning and no action, the knowledge is worthless. Without application of the knowledge, there's no progress. And without progress, it's all for naught. Just put it out there and do it. That transfers to one of the things I do on Drum Talk TV. I've been playing drums 52 years. I should be a lot better. But I've been playing 52 years. I'm not chasing rainbows anymore, trying to get a record deal or get a tour gig with this or record... I, I don't even have time to practice or work on my craft. Once or twice a week, I do a show that's live on our Facebook page, gets archived, then we put on all our other channels. It's called Dan's Almost Daily Vlog. And I think of a topic maybe ahead of time, maybe on the spot. And I, I just sit down at one of my two drum kits and I play and I talk to the audience. We share ideas. I ask for their feedback, ask for comments. I'm so comfortable in my skin. I, I don't care how well or not I play. I do this for exactly the reason 
of inspiring others to just make videos and get out there, get out there. Don't worry about, is the lighting right? Is my hair right? What will they say about the kind of symbols I have? Uh, Just make videos and get your information out there, folks. Whatever it is you're into, whether it's hiking, motorcycles, classic cars, entrepreneurship, gardening, music, just do it. Because until you do it, you won't move out of that box. And wherever we are, We're in a box. Oprah Winfrey is stuck in a box right now. Now, stuck doesn't mean it's going bad, but she's in whatever box she's in right now, which came from another box, which came from a box, which came. And I'm sure at some point she'll elevate to even another box. We're all on that sort of staircase of a journey. But if we don't take action to get out of that one box, we'll never get eight boxes ahead, let alone to the next box which we have to to get to that other box up there. So I I really love that topic because I'm just a schmo and and I love just showing how easy it is to just not be afraid and just don't worry about what people are going to think. And the reason why, Greg, is because some people will love it. Some people will hate it. Some people won't care. And you'll never change that no matter how good or bad we are. And that's all subjective at whatever We do. There's always going to be people who will criticize everything we do. Those people don't matter. Yeah, I think, and I'm going to paraphrase this probably pretty poorly, but my pastor said this. When I was young, I thought everybody was talking about me. When I grew older, I thought they were talking about me behind my back. And when I got to to my age now, I realized they weren't talking about me at all. (laughs) Yeah, and and it doesn't matter if they are either, I think. I really want to encourage people to just take action and just do it. My course, my main mastery mastermind group course, people have access to it for a year, for 12 months. And you don't have to wait till you've learned everything to apply it and get results. I tell people every session, you're going to learn something, apply it right away. The sooner you apply it, the sooner you'll get results. It's that simple. And you don't need to go through sessions one through 17 for 17 to make sense and for you to apply it. You got to start put, you got to push that car to bump start it into gear to then get it to go 30 before you can go 60. If you're 1% better for a hundred days, and you do it once a day, guess what? You'll be 100% better in about three months. That's that's an amazing leap. It really yep. is. You know. Yes, it is. Now, did you come from an entrepreneurial background at all? Did anybody in your family have their own business? Yeah, but not until my parents were in their uh, 50s. My mom, was, this came in handy when I had beautiful hair. My mom was a hairdresser is what we called it back then for forever until she retired in her fifties and then worked with my dad. My dad didn't graduate high school, was a self-made man, extremely intelligent. And he had odd job, not odd jobs, but he had, he had like welding jobs growing up. And then he owned a battery business, selling batteries to car dealerships, boat dealerships, stuff like that. And then he was offered a job to a friend who worked for the McDonald's Corporation. He was put on a fast track program and he ran the training department for the LA region for about 16 years and then retired and bought two Subway restaurants, sold one of them within a year for what he bought both of them for, and then decided to get out of food service. Him and my mom, my mom was an artist. He did metal sculpture as a hobby when I was really young. So they were both in art, kind of crafty. And they bought a fast frame store. And that's what they did until my father had a really bad heart attack, his fifth one that they say should have killed him. And then they sold that store. And then that was it. They Neither of them worked after that. So that's a long answer. I had to kind of think that through. I guess I, I do come from an entrepreneurial background. And when I was 20. Two, I had a glass carving business, making tables, room dividers, different things like that. But then I went into, I still played music, left it for a while, went into corporate America, went back to music. And I fell in love with video when I started my own TV show. And I had a great job when I started that show. I had a job as a national sales manager for a company that sold audio video gear. But I started this show 
and it took off. And I got to a point where I had to make a choice and I made a choice to go with the show. I had my own sponsors. It was my full-time gig, fell in love with the medium of video, started producing a couple other shows and doing post-production and then ended up leaving that and having my own video production company for about 14 years doing corporate videos, video bios or co company bios, different things like that. Lived in Australia for a little while doing charter yacht industry videos and different things like that. And then it was after I came home to take care of my dad towards the end of his life. And when he passed away, I went back home. My wife moved while I was away in Australia. I, I think I was supposed to know about that. And I was like maybe 12 miles from her when I was taking care of my dad. But I moved back home and I said, I don't want to work with big companies anymore. Let me just do your marketing. Yeah, we'll work together. Yeah. Ooh. She's a professional artist and seamstress and does therapy as well, art therapy. And after about three months, she said, you know, I think you need to find something that really fills your cup. And I was just about to turn 50. And I said, I, I don't know what that is. And she said, well, you told me you used to teach drum lessons. Why don't you do that? And I thought, oh, I'm a trained trainer because I have a, a certification as an NLP trainer. I know streaming video. I know video production. I did used to teach. I still play. That sounds great. So I started Dan's Drum Clinics, an online platform. And after three months of that, I started interviewing fellow educators. And when she saw that, she said, that's what you should do. Just do a drumming interview show. And I fought it. And I said, no, it's just a side thing on the website. It's just a separate thing. And then uh, a friend of mine saw it and said the same thing. So my wife really kind of came up with the idea of Drum Talk TV. And I started that, like I said, January 7th of 2013. And in the first year, we became the biggest, best, largest of our kind in the music industry. And I'm, I'm real proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that those numbers you read off at front and the fact that we haven't paid for advertising or boosting posts. But I want people to understand something. Whatever they do, whatever you do, you don't need a million followers and you don't need to reach millions of people a month. It was never a plan. It was never a target for me, but I teach from how I did that because how I did that, I used those same strategies to get to a thousand followers and 10,000 followers and a hundred thousand followers and so on. A million didn't occur to me till we got to half a million. And I thought, oh, all we need to do that is do that again. And we're at a million. That's the first time it even occurred to me. And, you know, twice a year, Greg, at least twice a year, there's professed experts in content marketing that talk about these algorithmic changes, these drastic changes that happen on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And they say, you'll never reach the same amount of people. You'll never get the same engagement. You'll never. The and I look at the algorithm change. I say, you know, I think I could figure this out. And I, I stop that. Well, I joke and say, you drummers are super hyper intelligent. That's how I did it. But that's actually, <laughs> yes. I, I've just looked at things differently, Greg. I don't pay attention to the herd mentality. I have a saying that everyone's busy doing what everyone else is doing because that's what everyone else is doing. So they figure it's the right thing to do. But they're following each other over the cliff, doing it wrong. I've always taken an objective view, used some critical thinking and some uncommon sense tried what I think will work, I've been able to get around every algorithm. This is how we reach millions of people a month without ever paying for ads or boosting posts. So even if someone has a bakery and they rely on just their surrounding four zip codes, you could still take these strategies and be the busiest bakery in your area. I guarantee it. So it's not that it's all about being this global, amazing, It's but that's part of my acumen and what I teach from. And it works, like you said in the beginning, for even nonprofits and garage bands to platinum bands. And, and I equate that to entrepreneurship, startups to people who have sold their third company for eight figures. And now they're starting again. It can work for that. You know, my students prove every eight to 10 weeks we do an exercise that's a test. It's a 12-point test where people pick mm -hmm. out, they just throw out their favorite big brand in whatever industry, it could be food, fashion, automotive, whatever. And they prove that they know more 
than the agencies doing the work for and the brands themselves, like Tabasco, Levi's, Toyota, Subway. And it amazes them because we go to those channels together as a group and they audit it and they go, oh my gosh, I know more. I said, you sure do. And I taught you that from my experience. Now keep applying it to your business and you'll be the best in your industry. It's now, actually you- really simple. Now, now, do you really even feel like you're getting around the uh, algorithms? Because as I understand it, you're really just giving people what they want. Not, I, I'm not trying to you know, belittle it or anything. I'm just saying that you're doing what everyone should be doing and that should be obvious, but yeah, really isn't because we you try know, to overthink things. You're right. When you boil it down, it's exactly that. What is it Zig Ziglar used to say? He used to say, in my best Zig Ziglar voice, <clears throat> if you give people more of what they want, you'll get more of what you want. That's what Zig used to say. And every brand from startup to legacy, from a startup shoe brand in a garage right now to Nike, they're all making the same mistake. And they're pounding us as consumers over the head with what's for sale, what's for sale, what's for sale, advertisement, advertisement, advertisement. There's no reason to follow a brand if that's all they're going to do. We have to mix in a majority of content that is community building content, interesting content, entertaining content, edifying, educating content for us to keep following them so that when we do advertise something, we have a captivated audience that that cares. And that's the, the really in a nutshell, what I teach, how to do that. Plus how it works on the different platforms A video will work one way on YouTube, then it will on Facebook, then it will on Instagram, that will on TikTok, then it will on LinkedIn, then it will on knickknack paddywhack. Don't step on a crack. You'll break your mama's back platform. <laughs> now you, you went through and you kind of gave a little bit of, of how you did what your path was, but I want to still go back to that because sure. a lot of times we just see the end result of somebody's success. And in your case, you've got drum talk TV, social media on steroids, you know, the courses in consulting. And you talked a little bit about it, but I want to kind of take a deep dive into how all that came about. Okay. Well, let's see. I love to teach. I love sharing. If I could use the word wisdom, Advanced Social Marketing, which is the home of social media on steroids, that's my marketing training company and consulting company. It's a sage brand. If we look at the 12 brand archetypes, it's a sage brand. The sage brand is to teach, share wisdom, edify people. Drum Talk TV is a primarily a jester brand. It's to bring joy to the world. It's silly. It's playful. The opposite of every other brand in our space in the music industry. So I love to teach. And when going back to when it was pointed out to me, how much we were achieving above these other brands in our space with Drum Talk TV that had been around for 10 to 37 years at the time, this is nine years ago, we were seven or nine months old. That's when I realized I really had something. That was the spark of creating workshops and courses to teach this. And I started teaching it in the music industry to startups, to bands that were on the rise or wanting to make it, to gold and platinum artists that were already there but needed to really learn this new thing of content marketing. And uh, then someone saw me speak at an event. I was helping Billy Cobham run an event and make a documentary. Billy is the forefather of fusion music, a drummer from okay. Mahi Fusion Orchestra, played with George Duke, all this wonderful stuff. And someone saw me speak and, and came up to me and said, that was great. Are you a member of NSA? And I said, uh, what's that? He said, National Speakers Association. And I said, uh, he says, oh my God, you don't know what that is. He says, there's so many clients waiting for you there. Come as my guest. I'm a member. The Arizona chapter is the founding chapter. I, I'm in Arizona. And and I reluctantly agreed to go because I don't I don't join things. Um, my wife and I do not join associations or clubs, or we don't book tours. We go do our own thing. But something told me to go. I also knew when I met this gentleman, I knew that he was retired from Intel. He managed thirty two hundred people. He taught at ASU along with four other universities and had a business consulting firm. I thought 
maybe I should listen to this guy and just go to this thing and see what it's about. In the first 10 minutes, I, the light bulb went on and I thought, oh my gosh, Kevin's right. There's all these different leaders and beginners in all these different industries that happen to congregate through the National Speakers Association because they all write books, they all do blogs, they all speak at events on what their area of expertise is. And as they started, I joined, in fact, I joined, this was in November of 2015 or 16, and I joined right away in time to go to next month's holiday party. And I told my wife, if there's ever a time to really get to know what people are about, it's when their hair is down a little bit. So let's go to this thing and check it out, see if it's worth sticking with. Amazing group of people from ages in their 20s to 70s. A few of the founding members are still alive and doing their thing still. One just passed away, sadly, recently. But it, 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 it just opened all these other doors outside of music. And now I started working with people in health and wellness, dental tech leaders in uh, real estate training and just on and on and on. And then I found my way through other industries, working with Ford dealerships and, and different things like that, which was wonderful because it proved what I knew, which was that what I provide can work for anything. It's just changing the suit that it's in. It's really all the same strategies. Some people want to believe they're different. Some people want to believe their business is so unique that there's no way you could teach what works for them. For me, they're in the potato chip industry. I am in hiking boots. It's ah. the same freaking thing. It's all the same. Yeah. So that was part of that pivot journey where I thought, okay, I'm going to teach this. Where's my tribe? It's right here, the music industry. But then the, going, joining NSA opened a whole new, it was almost like when Dorothy steps out of the house and everything turns to color. That was the difference. Okay. Yeah. There's been a few times in my life when I've had that, that mind shift and it's like whack on the side yeah. of the head. how did that happen? Why yeah. did I not see that before? Yeah. And I think I didn't because I, I didn't have that tribe yet. I didn't have that connection. And even though I was suspicious of, or I knew it would work for any industry, I didn't have those connections yet. And that one link, I mean, just think, if Kevin didn't attend my session at that day's retreat and didn't see me speak, I, I may have never found out about it. And it wouldn't have led me to work with these other industries. You never know who you're going to meet and how they're going to help you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned tribe. And yes. How does somebody that, if they don't have a tribe, how do they even go about not only finding their tribe, but defining their app target avatar and coming up with compelling content to attract their tribe, you know, for that. The, the real answer to that is in my course. <laughs> it's a okay. Big question. But, 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 but let me start with this. In order to find your tribe, you got to find you. Mm -hmm. And in order to find you, I encourage people to take a piece of paper or they could do this on the computer and draw three circles that intersect in the middle. So you get that sliver like this. And in those three circles, in one of them, you write skills. In one of them, you write opportunity. And in the other one, you write desire. And your skills are, that's kind of obvious, your attributes, what you're good at. Your opportunity is who are you connected with? Who are you connected with? That's Those are opportunities. Your desire is what do you really love to do? What makes you happy? And when you fill some things in those three circles, where those three circles intersect with that sliver, that's mm -hmm. what you should do. Once you know what you should do, it's easier to find or build your tribe. So if someone, I'm just going to throw out an example. If someone says, I've always been handy with cars. I'm not a professional mechanic. I'm an accountant, but I love tinkering and I've always fixed up cars. Those are some of my skills. I'm handy with tools and I learn quickly and I'm, I'm kinesthetic. I need to get in and feel it. Um, my opportunity is, uh, gosh, I live where there's a lot of, there's a lot of car clubs and, and things like that. And, and my desire is I've always wanted 
to get that 57 Chevy Bel Air. Uh, I don't know. I love that 63 split window Corvette though. So I, I don't know, but where those three meet, maybe that person needs to start a lifestyle brand around classic American cars or Italian sports car, whatever their thing is. And when you put all those together, it's easy to find your tribe. Now you join some car clubs, you go to a museum, you go to some of these ride events. Even if you don't have the car, you go and you start talking to people. Hey, how'd you get into this? How much is something like that? Well, really? I can get a classic car to fix up for only $20,000. I thought, you know, it just, and that's just one example. It could apply to pets, could apply to horticulture. I know people who have come up with inventions because of their love for pets, because of their consideration for people like me that struggle with arthritis. So they invented a glove that helps with arthritis. Me coming up with social media on steroids because I had such tremendous success with my strategies that I wanted to share it with other people so that they could share that. So that's, to me, how you find and, and build a tribe. Building the tribe re reflects on your other part of your question, the content marketing part and not just hammering people over the head. So you got to do this. I just happen to have one handy. You got to put on the fan's hat when you're designing content. <laughs> Ask yourself, is there too much? Am I just posting advertising? Am I just selling, selling, selling? And then ask yourself also, is this content cool? I mean, you got to sit at the grown-ups table, really be objective, and look through the fan's eyes where they're hat. And don't ask your friends. Don't ask your friends. They'll Why? lie to you. Yeah, well, and with their best interests at heart, they will walk with you, hold your hand, and nod all the way to the cliff and then let you fall off because they don't want to hurt your feelings. They, you need someone that's going to beat you up, kick you down the stairs, run down the stairs, kick you again when you're at the bottom of the stairs, tell you exactly what they think is wrong with what you're doing. But then ask 10 other people that'll do that. Because not everyone's going to have the same opinion and not everyone's the same, even if you think you've designed that one avatar that you sell hiking boots to. Here's an example. Let's say I have a hiking boot. Dan's boot. Get the boot. If all my videos showed seniors like me on hikes with Dan's boot, the young people, the 18 to 24 year olds would say, oh, those boots are for old people. I'm going on a real hike. I need some boots for me, for younger people, more agile people. But if all my boots featured the younger crowd, 18 to 24 year olds, the older people like me would see that and go, oh, those boots are for the young people. I, I need some boots for my wrinkly ass old mileage feet. They're the same boot. I hate that you're using yourself as an example because you're in a lot better shape than I am and could kick my ass. <laughs> well, people, peep, the point is people need to see themselves in the marketing and in the advertising. And advertising and marketing are not the same thing. And if people don't see themselves in either, it's not for them. Oh, that, oh, that's for them. And that's why in the last five years, especially, we're seeing more diverse cultural representation amongst people. You see a lot more mixed race couples. You see a lot more people who are mulatto, mixed white and black, or American Asian or American Asia major from India. You know, you could see this, you recognize mm -hmm. it, and there's nothing wrong with that. My wife is black, I'm not. Um, and and we, we we used to joke and say, hey, there's all kinds of new ads. What's with they're copying us? We'd go to Tractor Supply to get some supplies, and they got this kiosk of this porch swing, and it's a black lady. And a white. they're copying us again. There's more and more representation because there's more and more of that going on. People need to see themselves in it, but people need to see themselves, even if you have you think you have one avatar, you don't. Because there's age ranges, there's genders, there's culture, there's race, there's social strata economically, politically, but don't get into politics. I'll use one more example, if I may, if we have time. Sure. Some, someone who's my age, so let's say 60-ish, we'll say. Someone who's 60-ish and lives in Manhattan in an apartment and never left Manhattan is going to have one view of the world. That same age and gender living in Omaha, Nebraska, 
who never left Omaha, Nebraska, will have a completely different view of the world. Someone like me, male, 60-ish, white, who grew up in Los Angeles, but has traveled to four continents and lived on a different one for two years, I have a completely different... So we need to remember that we are catering to different people, even if we say, my target is late 50s, early 60s, white, male. We're still different. And, and we process things through our model of the world. And our model of the world is developed by our upbringing, our surroundings, and how much or not that changes over the course of our 24 years of life or 74 years of life. And as content creators, whether you're podcasting, blogging, whether you're doing email marketing, posting on social, whether you teach, whether you consult, whether you have a, a hard product for sale, we all have to abide by that or you're sunk. Don't ever think that you have one type of customer and don't ever think that your product is so different from everyone else's that you don't have competition. A bowling tournament in town, the same weekend as the carnival being in town, that's competition because someone might have to make a choice. Do I take the kids to the carnival or are we doing the bowling tournament that we've been working towards? For? Anybody who's in competition for the same dollar is your competition, even if they're not in the same industry or the same space. If they're catering to the same people, we don't all have an endless expense of supply of money. We have to make choices. Amen. It's important to remember that. Yeah. Now I've listened to you on a few other podcasts, including your own show. And I apologize for anything <laughs> up ahead of time right now. <laughs> yeah. Inclu I was going to say, including your own show, and seemed, you seem to have a really positive outlook on life and business. Have you always been that way? Yeah, I have. However, it's important to understand that when you see someone like me that I'm not saying I do, but exudes that. Mm -hmm. We all have our crap. Oh, We're yeah. either going through it or we've gone through it. And it's important for us as people to remember that. And as successful as my two businesses are, as much as I love doing them, there are frustrations and I have thrown things from time to time and I have found invented new expletives. If you have, if depending on how good you are, the Panthers might be interested in you at quarterback. <laughs> That's funny. But when it comes down to it, it's your foundation. You'll only fall so far if your foundation's way up there. You got to have a positive attitude. Um, I, I was fortunate. I know that not everybody is fortunate enough to say this. I grew up in a very loving home. My parents had dated since they were 16, they got married early they were 22 and 23 when they had me at one sister younger than me so when i grew up i wanted to be a dad i had a great example of that most of the kids i went to school with in high school they they were the youngest of their siblings so their parents were as much as 10 years older than mine and they couldn't relate and they always were bitching and complaining about their parents and i didn't get it just a quick story of how that can have an effect on someone. So I started playing drums at seven and at 14, that was really good. I was playing very difficult music. I was also playing in the school concert band and the Tuesday night jazz band. I, I wanted to be the next Jacques Cousteau. I wanted to be a scientist. My mom thought she had that all figured out when I was born. My first two initials are DR for doctor. How easy, how hard could it be? Right. It was all going to happen. My dad, when I was 14, took me to my first concert, a flash in the pan band no one's probably heard of. The name was Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and by the third song, Greg, the light bulb went on above my head and I thought, oh, you mean that could be a job? So a few days later, I got my parents together and I said, I don't think I want to be an oceanographer anymore. My mom said, oh, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a professional drummer like John Bonham. So after we waved the smelling salt over her face and hit her with the paddles and revived her, she moped around for about a week. And then a year later to the month, she found an ad for an audition that became my first paid touring gig around the country 
at 15 years old, in between ninth and 10th grade. And I went on tour opening for bands like Bloyster, Colt, Sticks, Heart, Seals and Crofts, Pap Boone at 15. And wow. it's because my parents supported me. They they believed that their kids should follow their interest and whatever that was, as long as it was legal and not going to hurt anybody. I got away with most of that. They would support that. And none of my kids are musicians for the same reason. I wanted, I was never going to force them into that. I went through so much heartbreak growing up as a teenager and in my 20s, chasing that record deal and tearing up the Sunset Strip, playing at every place that, that existed in the late 70s and through most of the 80s. I did not want to force that on any of my kids. If they showed interest, I was there. I was going to be their support system. But none of them did, so I never did that. Now, my wife, one of her kids, is a professional entertainer, and he's amazing. That's part of my where my positive attitude comes from, and it ties into what we said near the very beginning when you said you're a bit apprehensive about putting stuff out there, and I've always just b belly flopped in. A friend of mine, after I started my cooking show, he, he said, what do you know about doing a TV show? And I joked, and I said what I told you. I said, I've got seven TVs in my house. We had a bunch of kids at home at the time. I have seven TVs in my house. I know everything I need to know. And, and after he saw a few episodes, oh, I should mention this same friend, I recorded a soundtrack for movies demo, playing all the instruments myself about maybe six or seven years earlier. And then when he saw my cooking show, he said, you're so ignorant. You don't know that you don't know how to do something. So it doesn't hold you back. So you just end up getting it done. And I said, you're right. I don't ever want to believe I can't do it. I don't need to know how to do it to believe I can do it. I'm going to just dive in. I'll figure it out. Someone will teach me. I'll get the right people around me. It has always worked. It's always worked. And so I had that. I think that's part of that influence I had from that positive upbringing. You know? Exactly. Now, you mentioned on another podcast that the voice of your brand is everything. Now, what do you mean by brand? Is that just like your logo and your fonts and I'm throwing that out there because I saw your podcast. Yeah, that's a great that, but... question. A lot of people think that if they're a graphic artist and they create a logo and uh, swag and merchandise, that they created a brand. That's not, for the love of whatever you believe in people, that's not a brand. That's branding. Uh, that's branding. The brand goes back to the 12 brand archetypes. And if, if you don't mind me saying, I won't give it out now, but if you don't mind me saying, if anybody wants to email me and just put 12 brand archetypes in the subject line, I'll send that to you. I'll send you the 12 brand archetypes developed by Carl Jung, the father of analytic psychology. You can look it up, but I'll send you my PDF that has my take on it and the module from my course no cost, no commitment, so that you learn how this really works. Because the voice of the, every brand is one archetype or another or a combination of, but it's always going to be dominant in one. I mentioned earlier that advanced social marketing and social media and stories is a sage brand because we're teaching, we're sharing wisdom. And from Talk TV, it's a silly, playful, snarky sometimes, maybe even sarcastic. I would it's, argue it's, I don't it's argue just it's your piling out of this, the, B, the VW. <laughs> no, I'd argue it's infotainment. I'm not ne negating that. Yeah. And, and if you look at brands like, let's compare Apple to Microsoft. Microsoft is the clickety-clack reverberation of dress shoe heels walking down a vinyl tile floor with creased dress shirts, starched collars, and fluorescent lights, right? And an endless hall of doors. Yeah, everything's tip top. Whereas Apple, that's your laying on the ground in a meadow, looking at the wind blowing the clouds and trying to identify what flowers and birds and animals, the cloud. That's the difference between those two brands. And it shows in the company culture. It shows in the voice of the brand. Drum Talk TV versus Modern Drummer. 
and I can talk about them because, well, because I can. No, they are friends of ours. We've worked with almost every other media company in our space, but Modern Drummer is much more serious. We've been around for 43 years. We're the go-to. We're the legacy brand when it comes to media companies in the drumming space. We're very educational, and we're going to only, pretty much only, interview the legends. Whereas Drum Talk TV, you know, it's Dan. As the brand of the voice is my voice, really. You know, and we're going to do some things that others don't do. And it's not that serious. You don't have to start your shirts. You don't have to wear a dress shirt. You don't even have to wear a shirt, for goodness sakes. And we're going to do all that. We're going to cover the legends for you. Mix in a little bit of education, and we're going to curate content from all over the world from our fans in over 130 countries and cover events and do documentaries. It's going to be fun and silly and playful. Two different brands to serve two different kinds of people or to serve the same person in two completely different ways. And that's a big part, folks, of what can set you apart, not your product not your service. Do come up with a way that you can articulate what differentiates your product or service from others, but don't ever say there's no one like us or you don't have any competition because we all do. But your voice of the brand is going to resonate with EFG, XYZ, Elemental P, but it might not with ABC and a bunch of the others, and that's okay. Look, I have 11 kids and 19 grandkids, if there's one, one thing I've learned is you cannot make everybody happy with the same thing, and there's no reason to try. So be yourself, let your brand be you, and don't worry about trolls and the criticism, and the, not everyone's going to like it, and who cares? They're not your client, they're not your customer, therefore they're not your prospect. Don't worry about them. Okay. Going back to when we very first started, you know, I think imposter syndrome number one that hits everybody yeah. number two you really talk about knowing who you're and i hate to use the word avatar but who your avatar or your audience is yeah and you're only posting stuff that's really geared towards that audience you know on your different platforms yeah so. it's it it does get tricky but we have to drill it we have to decide who and i like to use the word persona I know a lot of people in the industry do use Avatar. I'm not criticizing that. I'll tell you what the difference is for me. The difference for me is that to me, Avatar is a graphic representation representation of something. Like if someone's in gaming, their avatar is that that thing, that I mm -hmm. like an icon almost, a visual yeah. icon. To me, a persona is what makes up that avatar. Who what is that avatar's traits? There are men and women. 18 to 24, they live in the city, they've got income from 50 to 100 grand. You know, to me, that's what makes up a persona. But it works the same way, whether we call it an avatar persona or a bowl of jello. We have to drill down and say, okay, how far can we break it down? Okay, so the men and women, okay, so men and women are different. I think we could all agree. Therefore, you got to have different content, maybe that speaks to the men, different content that speaks to the women, even though we're selling the same thing to them. They live in the city. They make 50 to 100 grand. We're selling the same thing, but they're men and they're women. They're different. Oh, oh wait, but some are single and some have families. Oh, that there's another difference. we got to appeal to them in their way. You know, there's all these different factors that are important to recognize rather than assume that your avatar or persona is all the same person because the, the danger that we get into with that is a one-size-fits-all marketing and advertising. And that never works for the reason I said with the boot example, they need to see themselves in the marketing and advertising. The marketing is what gets people to respond to the advertising. If the great marketing is not in place, an advertisement is like, okay, so, but the marketing is what edifies people about the brand, what makes them fall in love with the brand, what makes them like the brand, trust the brand. So when they advertise, they say, okay, yeah, I'll go check that out. Oh, I'll buy one of those. Yep, give me the coupon. Let me try it. Okay. Now, what are some of the common mistakes that people make when it, that you see when it, when it comes to content marketing? Oh, there's one, and that's not taking my course. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It really is not only the one-size-fits-all approach, but that coupled with only 
advertising and telling people what the offer is. Here's what I do. Here's what I do. Here's who I do it for. Here's what I do. This is for sale. This is for sale. Here's our product. Here's our product. Rather than building a tribe, a community around the brand. And some people make the mistake mixed in with that, Craig, that they only need followers who are prospects who are likely to become customers or clients. And that is another herd mentality. That's high on the BS meter because everyone knows someone who knows someone who's perfect for you, for what you have to offer. So we need people that don't, maybe they won't buy from us ever, but they'll be advocates. They'll still fall in love with our content. And they'll be part of that following, part of that engagement, part of that crowd lined up outside the restaurant. You've driven by 10 times. You've never gone in. And the one across the street, the parking lot's almost empty. Which one would you go to? It, it ties into social proof and credibility and trust and all those things as well. So we can't limit our, I only want people to follow me who I'm likely to sell to. You've got your eye on the wrong ball. Remember what Zig said. You give people more of what they want and they'll give <laughs> you more of what you want. And sometimes that means just putting stuff out there to entertain, info everybody, make everybody happy, and the right people will come to you to make the purchase or hire you or at least come look or sign up for your email <laughs> list, whatever it is. All right. Now, in 2022 and beyond, what online platforms do you see as being the best for small business owners to engage in? It depends. On, that's a great question because it depends on what business they're in. At the same time, I do have a couple or three everything platforms, and those are YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And I know some people are hearing that thinking, oh, my customers aren't on Facebook or Facebook's only for older people. None of that is true. I have all the data and not just me. There's plenty of data out there to support that the younger people are on Facebook, not every young person, but the younger demographic is absolutely on Facebook. And the seniors like me are also on TikTok and Instagram. When people say, yeah, the seniors aren't on TikTok, I say, really? I say, I'm a senior. I've, I follow TikTok. And you know who I follow? I follow Anthony Hopkins, Al Pacino. Brian May, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone. They're all seniors older than I am. It's, it's the most ridiculous herd mentality. But TikTok is important as well. YouTube is number one or two to anything else because it's the number two place to be found owned by the number one, which is Google. If you leverage and really master YouTube, it will be huge for you. I hardly ever look anything up on Google anymore. I look it up on YouTube because I want to see how to do it. How does it work? Um, yeah, som sometimes that works for me, but I, a lot of times I like to see the written steps, you know, but yeah. I guess it, yeah, different strokes for different folks. But even it's all how we're wired. Yeah. Some yeah. people are more digital like you are. I'm more visual. I, I can't, I'm not illiterate, but I can't learn from a manual. There's just too much there. It has no context because I haven't done it yet. I need to see it, see how it gets put together, put my hands in it. Then if I need help, I can go to the help menu and read and go, oh, okay, I know what they're talking about because I've seen it or done it. And yeah, it's just how different people are wired. Absolutely. Yeah. But those yeah. are the biggest platforms, I think, moving forward. Where there's something called the TikTok economy. TikTok is still kind of the Wild West. It doesn't have all the reach thwarting algorithms built in yet. So TikTok is critical to get onto right now. you got to work LinkedIn if you're a business person or in business of any kind or own a business of any kind. And Facebook simply for two reasons. One, it has the largest population of any other platform, 3 billion people using it every day. Two, it has every bell, whistle, feature, function, benefit, app, hoozy doodle, knickknack, paddywhack thing that all the others have put together. You master how Facebook works. You can master content marketing on any platform. So Fun what are you working well. on that's new and exciting? Let's see. I'm actually... So with Trump Talk TV, just real quick, we're putting a subscription model together, which we've never done. That'll have different levels of different access to different things. It'll be gamified. And with gamification, you can earn points and get another level or access to new things at no extra charge. Really neat experiences with artists and things like that. We're also getting into the NFT space with NFT 
content that is going to be our own intellectual property, as well as licensing stuff with artists that we work with. I'm excited about that. On the advanced social marketing, social media on steroids side, I just came up and released to today, pretty much it's Monday. Yeah, it's the official release of my mastery course that I teach in mastermind groups, but a self-guided version of it. Self-guided version of it that has... I say it as a third of the content, but it's the most robust self-guided thing out there that no one else has. It comes from real life strategies, getting real life results from my 50,000 plus hours of doing it right. And it's a fraction of the cost of my uh, mastermind groups thing. And everyone who signs up for that still gets a, a group call with me once a month. I wasn't going to do that. But I decided, ah, that's just important, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I added that. So I'm excited about that because there's a lot of people I want to help that just quite frankly, they can't afford the other thing. But this just about anybody should be able to. Really. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you don't mind my asking, what are the prices? The Mastermind Groups course which is my ma highest level of what I teach, the mastery mastermind course is a hair under $15,000. It's a year Ooh. access sessions twice a week, access to the unfolding library. But if you think about it, it's less, it's, they don't teach this in college. You can't go to any university and get a marketing degree and learn what I teach. And it gets updated as things change. However, not everyone can just pay for it and register for it. There's no link to it to register on my website because I have to make sure that people are a fit for it. It's not just about swiping their card. Hey, you're in. One bad apple can ruin that experience for everybody, and it's just not a fit for everybody. The new thing, they can read about it and fill out a form and write me, and then I'll interview them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a tremendous experience. It really is. Like I say, my students learn more than everyone working at the agencies for in the marketing department for brands like Toyota, Subway, North Face, Salvation Army, Levi's, Tabasco. I can go on and on and on. The new thing is only $47.97, I believe is what it is. $47.97, and uh, it, it's self-guided, and there's over 30 hours of info that are taken from the other thing. It's from the archive library. So it's the same information. You just don't have access to uh, the live calls with me twice a week that the others have. Um, it has the same exercises, tools, and homework attached to those relevant modules. Um, and it's, like I say, it's less than a third of the fee. And it's a huge investment. And if someone decides they wanna upgrade, they learn, they apply what they learn. It's starting to work for them, and it will. It's guaranteed 100%. The only way it doesn't work is if people don't do exactly what I teach. I've never had to give a refund. Has it not worked for people? Of course, because some people get lazy or they reinvent it or they don't connect all the dots. If they do exactly what I teach, it will work. But if they decide to upgrade to the other thing, I give them a discount and I credit what they already paid for the self-guided course. 15000 if it moves your business forward, it's oh. well worth it. Let's get ready to wrap this up. What's the number one piece of advice that you can give for our listeners? Be open to the real information. Don't do what everyone else is doing just because that's what they're doing. Think for yourself. Learn from an expert, even if it's not me. Learn from another expert or myself, from someone who's had tremendous results doing it. There's not a lot out there. A friend of mine who writes business books says, never take advice from someone who hasn't done what you want to do. Everyone on LinkedIn, everyone that has one of these lists, social media as a skill, none of them are getting results. I don't, that's like me wearing tennis shoes and saying I'm a tennis pro. Learn and learn from the best. And if it's not me, if I don't resonate with you, I'm not offended. But look at what someone's done and learn from them. I can't imagine you're not resonating with somebody, but, you know, we'll leave that there. I now, what's think the best? of some ex-wives, but. <laughs> <laughs> what's the best way for people to check you out, Dan, and get in touch with you? Thank you. They can go to www.advancedsocial.com marketing.com 
advancedsocialmarketing.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Look up Dan Schinder. That's S-H-I-N-D-E-R. There's no C. There's no L. It's not Schneider. It's not Schindler. Um, it's been no shit at once, but but yeah, it's Dan, <laughs> it's Dan Schinder on LinkedIn. Or they can email me if you want to email me at programs dot inquiry at advanced social marketing dot com. And if you write me with twelve brand archetypes and in the subject line, say what you're interested in. And just, I'll also, if you have questions, I'll also send you my PDF explaining the 12 brand archetypes and a copy of that video module that you can just download. And that'll make its way to me. If you have other questions and want to learn more about my programs, uh, that'll definitely get to me. But it's program inquiry. Is it inquiry or inquiries? You know what? How funny. I got to look. Yeah. Oh, it's program dot inquiries. <laughs> <laughs> at advancedsocialmarketing.com. And the dot is lowercase. I really appreciate this. I love what you're doing. Entrepreneurs over 40, that's an important topic. My wife was 50 when she became an entrepreneur. Well, Dan, great. have a great rest of your evening. Check out the newly redesigned Entrepreneurs Over 40 website at www.entrepreneursover40.com. While you're there, sign up to get updates from us. Also, don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss any other episodes. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40. Check us out at entrepreneursover40.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast directory.